Yes, I just had some very quick slides. I figured it'd be e easier to steer the conversation. Um, I wanted to just give a very brief update on the hazard mitigation plan. Um, and then in addition to that, we have our partners at the Charles River Watershed Association who are gonna give a brief presentation on resiliency um, in the Charles River, which really goes hand in hand with much of the work that we're doing on the hazard mitigation plan. So uh, let me just share, uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So the town is underway on a hazard mitigation plan, which is being funded entirely by a MEMA grant that we were fortunate enough to receive. Uh, this is a follow up to the town's municipal vulnerability plan that we did several years ago and a recommendation of the climate action plan. We're fortunate to be working with Jamie Kaplan Consulting LLC, who has done many successful plans in our peer communities and throughout Massachusetts. Um, there's a great team that we're working with here. Um, just to give sort of set the stage. So hazard mitigation is defined as any sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate the long-term risk to life and property from hazard events. So actions to minimize risk to people, property, and the environment. And we really are focusing on here, natural hazards. Uh, I want this one. Okay. So as part of that, um, the plan is being worked on by a cross-departmental and public uh, review of both critical infrastructure, how hazards may impact the critical infrastructure, and ways for the town to plan ahead to minimize the risks, again, to people, property, and the environment. So on our group, we've created a local hazard mitigation planning group that <laughs> is attending sort of behind the scenes meetings with the consultants. and. As things come up, we've invited other individuals or groups or organizations to participate. Um, so from this list, you know, we have select board members, select board staff members, um, Amy, myself, and Stephanie as the uh, PIO, our sustainability director, Mary Beth Martello, assistant fire chief, Nat Brady, and retired assistant chief, uh, Jeff Peterson, police chief, Jack Blecky, NRC director, Brandon Schmidt, Facilities, Joe Murray, who also happens to be our ADA coordinator. Uh, Health Director Lenny Izzo, Housing Authority Director Jackie Sullivan, MLP Sustainability uh, Staff Lisa Wolf, uh, DPW Director and Assistant Director uh, Dave Cohen and Jeff Azano Brown, Town Engineer Dave Hickey and Assistant Town Engineer George Saracino, IT Brian DuPont, GIS Manager Mike Thompson, um, Eric Arbini from Planning. Uh, we will have staff representation from Babson and Wellesley College. And so COA, um, Greg Wilson was a member of the team. That position is currently vacant and we're, we're sort of in between for both assistant and the director position, but we'll bring folks on as soon as they're available. Um, so one of the other things that um, we were focusing on as part of this plan is just that the town has two environmental justice population areas, one by Wellesley College and one by the vicinity of Cedar and Walnut Street, which uh, are some of the town's most vulnerable populations, largely due to language barriers. Um, and so we're working specifically to try and reach out to them to make sure they're part of this process. The um, local hazard mitigation plan will focus on ensuring aspects uh, that this plan are gonna be consistent with other town plans, including plans like our unified plan, our housing production plan, uh, climate action plan, open space and rec plan, sustainable mobility, um, and also the town's bylaws and regulations. So uh, additionally, the plan will focus on both town structure and infrastructure projects, natural systems protection, and then uh, education and awareness. An example of that will be, you know, primarily focusing on the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, this plan will focus on the hazard and risk assessment. Then there'll be a community's capabilities assessment, an identification of mitigation strategies, and then plan implementation and maintenance. This is sort of the track that all hazard mitigation plans um, go through. So just in terms of a timeline, um, we had a kickoff meeting with the consultants in August, and we've been working uh, since that time to pull our local planning team together. And through October, we've been pulling information together on critical infrastructure in town, the town's uh, floodplain zoning information, and potential mitigation me measures that have been raised from previous plans like the Climate Action Plan, the MVP Plan, hazard mitigation, things of that nature. Um, so we are, we're actually meeting 
Thursday, this Thursday for our next um, short interdepartmental meeting. They basically give us a host of assignments that we have to come back with additional information for them. Uh, but we're also then going to have our first public meeting on November 16th at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom, where we'll, we'll have a presentation on hazard mitigation plan and then get public input on um, critical infrastructure and different uh, areas potentially that we'd want to look to mitigate on. And uh, right now we're proposing to have our sub second public meeting, March, 2023, and that hopefully we would finalize the plan by April. This plan would need to be approved by both MEMA to ensure compliance with the state's hazard mitigation plan, and then um, FEMA. I just have one other quick slide. So just quickly the benefits, what, you know, why should we do a hazard mitigation plan? So, um, you know, largely some of it is just to identify, you know, different, actions to reduce risk. So, you know, when we think about um, stormwater infrastructure, obviously, you know, the board's aware that's something that we've been really putting focus on because flooding has been a major component in town. So planning ahead um, to right size infrastructure will be a benefit long term to try and reduce then flooding hazards um, on residential properties. Um, it tends to, you know, planning ahead in investing in our capital infrastructure now prevents, you know, longer term uh, costs. And it also increases awareness. So big component of the hazard mitigation plan is also talking about um, communication, education, and awareness. So on your own residential property, if you're in proximity to major water areas like the Charles River, which flows through much of town. Um, and then it also provides an opportunity to build partnerships mm -hmm. with um, different organizations, including Charles River Watershed Association, um, and then the other benefit is having a hazard mitigation plan does, in fact, open the door to additional grant opportunities, including um, resiliency grants, which become really important in terms of implementation of the climate action plan um, and some of our systems, including stormwater, electric, MLP may be able to benefit from those types of resiliency grants. So that's a very quick overview um, on, oops, sorry, why we're doing the plan and the components of the plan. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on that. I was trying to give high level um, and then you know put it in context of how uh, Dira and the Charles River Waters Association and Robert Kearns is here as well, how they play a role in hazard mitigation and resiliency. Colette, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I just had kind of not really a question, but I just wanted to flag something. So like one of the critical services we have in town is transportation. And I'm thinking about the um, the T in particular. And so fast forward into the future when the T is fully electrified, you know, and we hope that will happen as soon as possible. But then, you know, we will be, we're regionally um, interdependent. Uh, how do we think about things where our transportation, if we're electrified, is probably going to depend upon battery and electrical um, elements are outside our town's borders? And is that going to be touched on in this plan or no, it will be, it will be sort of identified as something that's exterior? So we'll definitely highlight those types of things, number one, because um, it's in our community, right? So the, the T travels through, the commuter rail system travels through Wellesley and has a direct impact on our residents. But, but in addition to that, um, our plan has to be consistent with the state's hazard mitigation plan. There's like an acronym that I can't say, <laughs> but essentially, and I can guarantee the MBTA is part of that in terms, you know, in terms of that, um, the corridor and the potential. Really where in Wellesley, the major implications for the commuter rail would be, um, comes from erosion and from flooding largely. So major storm events that could potentially either have, where we've had in the past actually, we've had trees down that have delayed service or water issues. Um, we have in particular over by Honeywell Field, we have a drainage system that runs and you all know where I'm talking about, basically underneath the MBTA over to um, Lee Field. And so that that culvert's undersized, that will, I would think, certainly be in the plan as an example. Any other questions before we move? Uh, so I think Dara's, Dara's going to give us a presentation, right? Yes. So uh, Lisa, I'll just introduce, so, 
Uh, Deer and Robert are here from Child River Watershed Association. They have a few slides. Um, I've, I've sort of given the board a, a high level um, on what hazard mitigation is, and Deer is going to delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Deer. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for having us, and thank you, Select Board, for, for having us tonight. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Deer Johanna. I am the urban. Oh, actually, let me share my screen first. Um, I am the urban resilience advocate at Charles River Watershed Association, and I work a lot with my colleague Robert Kearns, who's the climate resilience specialist um, at CRWA, and we both do a lot of work connecting with um, cities and towns in our watershed, thinking about ways to increase climate resiliency um, across the watershed. And so tonight we're going to do a little background about CRWA, but and then go a little bit deep into some of the um, hazard mitigation related stuff to the work that we do. So um, before we do that, I'll just do a, a quick um, land acknowledgement um, in the fact that um, our organization humbly acknowledges that the Charles River watershed resides on occupied territory of um, the Massachusetts Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes. And we recognize and acknowledge them as the past and present future takers of the land in which our work carries across. And if you're not too familiar with our organization, just a quick overview. Um, we were founded in 1965 by a group of concerned citizens when the state of the Charles River was um, really dirty. Maybe some of you remember of how colorful and stinky it was. Um, we're one of the oldest watershed associations in the country and our mission is to protect, restore and enhance the Charles River and its watershed through science advocacy on the law. So we've worked with um, you know, at the federal level, at the state level, and also across our watershed with the 35 towns and cities in our um, in the Charles River watershed to think about climate resiliency. Um, and internally, we have an interdisciplinary staff and we have program areas that cover very um, various um, mission of our work, including climate resilience and stormwater solutions. Um, and this is a, um, a nice image of our watershed and where you guys are located in our watershed. You're entirely um, in our watershed and you're bounded by the Charles River. Um, our, the river is 80 miles long and you're one of the 35 towns. Um, currently there are 20 dams across um, the Charles River main stem. And the role that we take or the view that we take when we do our work is thinking about everything at a watershed scale view because what happens, especially in upstream neighborhoods has an impact on the downstream neighborhoods. So um, we have to look at it um, at this scale when we think about climate resiliency and solutions. And as an organization, a lot of things that Robert and I especially do is look at all the towns and cities and look at what policies and regulations are in place or what plans um, different towns and cities have that, um, that work towards um, climate action or climate resiliency. And here, these are some of the strategies that we've identified for Wellesley. And um, just to reiterate what Megan was saying, we're here kind of as a resource and um, a partner for you all to think about what are the next steps and strategies to increase, um, to increase climate resiliency. Um, and I've had some discussion already with Megan and Lisa about you know, the four that's on this list. And we're really excited to hear that you're working on all four of them. And we're really excited, especially today, that um, creating a hazard mitigation plan for Wellesley is, um, is in the works. And so we're really excited because the actions that you guys take can and will improve the river health um, and protect Wellesley as well as the surrounding communities from climate change impacts such as flooding. This is also another quick snapshot of what we've experienced across the river, um, across the watershed in terms of climate change impacts, including intense rainstorms and drought, as well as, um, as, well as um, heat waves. And in this kind of green box are the vulnerabilities that were identified from your MVP report, which include intense storms, flooding, heat waves, and droughts. And so we know these are things that um, you're already experiencing and we know that with climate change it's going to be exacerbated and so this is a really critical time to think about how you mitigate those um, those events and um, and a lot of the work that we do 
is also revolved around what happens, you know, even though we're a river organization, a lot of the work is um, revolved around what happens in terms of landscapes in our watershed. And that's because when we do development and we add more hardscapes or impervious surfaces like your buildings and your roads and your highways, we're changing the water cycle in our environment. Um, and in the case of um, adding more impervious surfaces, we're increasing more stormwater runoff that carries pollution to the river. And in the case that the stormwater runoff doesn't have anywhere to go or is already, um, there's, um, the river capacity is um, already full, then you're creating flooding scenarios in your neighborhood. So that's um, you know, one thing to consider for in Wellesley um, when you think about how you're developing your community or how you're planning for the future. And that also um, is relevant to what you think about or how you plan your hazard mitigation. And with that, I'll pass it off to Robert. Thank you so much, members of the uh, select board. Um, this graph here just shows um, all the different communities in the watershed, 35 cities and towns that Deere was talking about, and highlighted in the right side is where Wellesley is, is compared um, to other communities with uh, respect to impervious services or that blacktop pavement, et cetera. And you can see it's more on the more uh, more on the right side of the graph, meaning that it has more um, of those impervious surfaces compared to some more of the rural areas like Sherborne on the far left. Next slide. And this uh, image shows uh, looking at similar things, but geographically. So, um, and I highlighted Wellesley in the red circles there. On the left, the darker areas are areas of more of that blacktop pavement um, and, and you know hardscapes. And on the right is flood vulnerability. You can see there's a correlation between um, having more parking lots and more um, impervious areas and um, more flooding. So next slide. So what, as you all probably know, the impact to the river health from adding a lot of these uh, hardscapes is stormwater pollution. So every at any time when it rains, anything that's on those hard surfaces like the sidewalks, streets, parking lots, your oils, your greases, your fertilizers, um, dog poop, that goes directly in the river. Um, when it goes through the storm drains, or the grates in the street, um, in the gutter. So people sometimes, it's definitely for members of the public who may be listening, you may think that that goes to the water treatment plant and gets filtered. It actually doesn't, unless um, the things like the like the town of Wellesley is doing to do the green storm infrastructure to filter it through nature-based solutions before it gets into the river. So we're really happy that the town is working on solutions like that to really bring back nature into the built environment and redevelopment really offers an opportunity to do that as well um, for some areas that were already hardscapes. Next slide. And one of the first original, we call it the OGGI, or one of the original nature-based solutions is the Natural Valley Storage Area, which y'all may not be familiar with, but it's a <clears throat> bunch of um, wetlands um, upstream and uh, it's non-contiguous. So there's a bunch of different ones some areas in like Sherborne and Medfield, but closer to home here in Wellesley, up in um, Cutler Park and Needham and Newton, those areas are preserved by the Army Corps of Engineers through easements and through acquisitions. And they're essentially a big sponge, a bunch of wetlands that hold back water during flooding events um, to help prevent flooding in downstream places like Wellesley, but also Boston and Cambridge. Um, and this was developed because of Hurricane uh, Connie and Diane, back in the 50s, um, where there was a lot of uh, devastating flooding in Boston and other communities throughout the watershed. And uh, one of our predecessors, Rita Baer, and one of our first executive directors uh, took some of the Army Corps folks upstream um, to see these wetlands to help preserve them. So it's one of the original nature-based solutions that helps us here today. Next slide. And uh, this kind of goes off of what Megan was saying, but um, high level, uh, looking at all of your different plans, your climate action plan, your open space plan, MVP or municipal vulnerability preparedness plan, all these collective plans are so important for the community to help identify your climate and natural hazards to really build a stronger community. And the work that you all are doing in the town has been is really exciting because having these plans reference each other actually makes you more competitive for state grant funding um, 
And with the hazard mitigation plan, um, you know, it's going to be a, sort of a roadmap to really look at solutions to a lot of these natural um, hazards and, and get you set up to be um, able to get those federal funds, like Megan was saying. Next slide. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight um, for a hazard that is in Wellesley is um, it's not owned by the town, thankfully, but it's the Newton Lower Falls Dam or the Finley Dam. We did some, we were looking at all the dams in the watershed. We did a freedom of information request to the DCR Dam Safety Office, and we looked at all the condition of all the dams. But this dam in particular is a significant hazard potential dam. So if it were to breach, it could cause property damage downstream. And at the latest inspection, it was rated in poor condition. And like I said, it's owned by DCR. So it's not the, um, town's responsibility to fix it or to remove it, but um, it's something that I think the hazard mitigation plans will look at identifying infrastructure like dams um, to look at, you know, ways to reduce risk. And um, one thing, just a historic thing I found is back in 1954, State Department of Public Works actually looked at potentially removing the dam. Um, they chose not to just because people like the view of it, but um, there's a, a big change in, in, in the state looking at dams potentially to remove. And this is one that could be potentially looked at um, in the future. And we've had conversations, we as CWA, with the Natural Resources Commission in Wellesley to talk about some other dams downstream in Watertown, which are really uh, impacting the native fishery um, that comes up into Wellesley and other communities um, and working on um, some language to help show the importance of restoring fisheries in, in the natural resources in Wellesley and surrounding communities. Next slide. Um, and one other thing I just want to highlight and thank um, members of the town staff, including Brandon Schmidt from the Natural Resources um, Department. He's a member of our Climate Compact, which is a regional collaborative that Charles River Watershed was started um, in 2019, which brings communities together. We have 25 cities and towns that are talking month by monthly about climate change adaptation and looking at it at a regional scale to really leverage, um, you know, support. Uh, and work collaboratively. Um, sorry, this uh, car alarm going off. Um, and it's really been looking at the challenges of, uh, uh, you know, working collaboratively and regionally. And we meet bi-monthly on Zoom and Wellesley, like I said, thank you to Brandon as an active member. Next slide. And one of the things that came out of that was the Charles River Flood Model, which is a project that looks at um, where flooding is happening today, but also where in the future with climate change, with the increased precipitation we're gonna be seeing, um, where flooding will occur in the future and, and looking at particular uh, things like upland storage, like uh, green infrastructure to help reduce those risks. Um, and it's a computer flood model that's available on our website and anybody in the public can, can check it out. Um, and you can see on the map on the right is of Wellesley and you can see some of the areas of concern, um, including roads around the high school, section of Winchester Street and around the Charles River, as you all know, can flood um, like back in 2010. And this is a really great resource that um, the town can use to help educate the public, but also use it in these planning processes to show visually where flooding um, is happening and where it could happen more in the future. In the next phase, um, we're looking at working at uh, assessing culverts at more de fine detail for not only the condition of them, uh, but also looking at fish and wildlife passage. So that's something that I know Megan was mentioning culverts. It's a big issue for municipalities. So we're really excited to be looking at them at a regional scale to help leverage it, um, funding and that sort of thing. Next slide. And Deer and I just want to thank you all for your time and um, open for any questions. Any questions from the board? I'll just say thank you so much for um, for coming and for the presentation. I know um, uh, the Charles River Watershed Association has just been a great resource for the town. I served on the Natural Resources Commission before I uh, was elected to the select board, and um, and it's a great. We're we're lucky to have you as as partners. It's a tremendous resource for our whole region. So thank you. Um, any questions from the board? Lisa, I, I did just want to um, also indicate that Laura Crawford was here as well. I know oh, she yes. Gosh. to speak on this matter. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you, Megan. Laura, did you want to 
offer some comments? Hello. Um, my name is Lara Crawford and I live at 15 Rice Street. Um, I'm very uh, glad that we are discussing about um, the watershed, um, but, and I would like to uh, urge the members of this board to put the natural world, the natural world's needs in front of economic development gains. Wetlands are disappearing faster than forests. Wetlands offer a lower cost solution to harness nature. Um, uh, nature's fight, excuse me, to climate change and are also formidable in countering effects of flood and drought. And while this governing board is discussing wetlands as a way to provide stormwater runoff, another fellow governance board is seemingly doing everything possible to destroy the wetlands with construction at the same time. Uh, isn't the area around the track and field a wetlands habitat? Um, the Climate Action Plan specifically discusses actions for wetlands and includes a strategy to prioritize the role of wetlands in enhancing Wellesley's resilience to climate change. And on the grant application that I uh, that was uh, from 2019, the Wetlands Protection Committee letter of support stated that 10% of all the land area of our community falls within 100 or 200 feet of riverfront buffers. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I just, I, I guess I want to just pose a few questions uh, for the board to consider. Um, the main, the main point though on all of this is what in what mechanism really do you have to ensure that other governing boards are also working in conjunction, conjunction, because otherwise, no matter what you do, everything will just be lip service. So does compromising wetlands, which are part of the Charles River watershed with construction for light poles, stadium lights and buildings increase or decrease flood risk? Does compromising wetlands, which are part of the Charles River watershed with construction for light poles, stadium lights and buildings increase or decrease stormwater runoff? Does compromising wetlands, which are part of the Charles River watershed with construction for light poles, stadium lights and buildings increase or decrease water quality? And does compromising wetlands, which are part of the Charles River watershed with construction for light poles, stadium lights and buildings increase or decrease climate change um, actions? Unfortunately, what no one is considering is what is the mechanism to ensure that, other, that the other governing boards all work together? And I hope that you will consider, I was very happy to hear about the, um, the Charles River Watershed presentation about put, putting in stronger um, ordinances around wetlands. And I strongly encourage you to consider that. Thank you for uh, the time. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Laura. Um, so any other comments or questions from the board? Well, I know we're going to hear more about the hazard mitigation plan as it moves forward, and I would encourage everyone to attend the is November 16th, right, is the um, event for, for the plan? Yes, November 16th at 630. Um, I know it is a bit busy night in Wellesley, so the meeting will be recorded and uh, rebroadcast as well. Great. All right. Well, Dara and Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Colette, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just sorry, I, I should have mentioned this a minute ago. I was very interested to hear uh, that you'll be working with the DCR in terms of, or at least I hope that we can get some more clarity in terms of the DCR's um, intention for that dam in the long term. And I think it's really helpful to have a plan to talk with an organization like that that does so much work that is so thinly spread and under budgeted. And so trying to work together with all the communities to say in, in, the, in the larger scheme of things, there are many dams in that river. We, we need to do that sort of discussion all at once because I think that it's certainly something we've um, discovered on the mobility um, from the working together with all of our neighbors, we all have similar issues with a department that's overstretched is a much better step forward. So I was really, that was one thing in the 
presentation tonight that I thought was very helpful. So I just want to mention that. Thank you. Very helpful presentation. Okay. All right. Um, executive director's update. So just briefly, we only have really one thing. We're going to defer on the minutes. I got a, a number of different edits, so I'll just put those in for the next meeting. Um, and the main item I wanted to have the board approve was the funding for War Memorial. Um, so the scholarship committee is they're gearing up their materials, would just like to know what the amount is. Uh, staff is recommending $10,000, which is what was approved last year as well. Um, and that's generated by two bibs for the um, marathon. So we will, you know, maintain, our recommendation is to maintain the 10,000 again this year. So I, I certainly support that and I invite any comments and questions okay. from anyone. It seems reasonable to me, Lisa. Beth? Yeah, I support it, Lisa, and I like that it's consistent with what we are raising each year at a minimum. Okay, well, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Beth, do you want to make the motion? Ready. Move to authorize $10,000 for the 2023 War Memorial Scholarship. Second. Beth? Aye. Colette? Aye. Tom? Aye. And I vote I as well. I I think Ann Mara had to leave us, so yep. yeah. That's all I have for tonight, Lisa. Okay, great. Well, with that, I'm going to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. And Thank sorry you. we went a bit late, but it's not even seven o'clock. <laughs> Good night, everybody.